Yeah. One of the bo oh, shoot. Yeah. One of the boys. Excellent, excellent. Yes. Which one? Rockwell. Everyone loves that. Everyone loves that episode. Under pressure. Under pressure. Another one of my favorites. Um, okay, so I'm going to bring these guys in in a few minutes. Get ready to give them a big round of applause for the Nickelodeon Loud House panel. All right. All right. Look at you. We all have lines too. <laughs> yeah. Right. I have a few trivia questions, and I, um, I, I, they're all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <what's>... <laughs> <laughs> Facebook. This is Facebook Live on the fan page. Both got a lot of it. There we go. It's very nice. I'm kind of worried how much. 72%. Okay, that's not bad. <laughs> or so. Uh, my name is Sean Genka. I'm the production manager on the Loud House. I monitor schedules. <laughs> hey, I'm Amanda Linda. Um, I'm the art director and I see, oversee every visual element to the show um, from right. single teardrop to a national park covered with just to be known, creator of the Loud House, and I am involved in every aspect of production. So whatever they say, I'm involved with. <coughs> I'm Jordan Kaish, I'm a storyboard artist on the Loud House. Uh, uh, I'm Kevin Sullivan, I'm a writer on the Loud House, and I get yelled at by Amanda for asking for those fields covered in snow. <laughs> Awesome. So as we were uh, trying to think about what we wanted to do for a panel, we thought that it would be kind of a fun idea to walk through the process of making uh, the Loud House specifically. Um, so we're going to sort of walk through briefly the different stages of making an episode. Uh, and then we want to make sure that we have a lot of time for any questions that you guys might have uh, for any of us. Yeah, we, we, we have so many questions to ask you, Mr. Savino. Uh -huh. <laughs> we, yeah, you bet we do. <laughs> Come on. I got People are usually very, you know, uh, there's struggles to find questions for people. Um, so, obviously with, uh, with a show like The Loud House, we're, we're what's called a script-driven show, um, which means we start with the script first, and the script is what drives a lot of the stuff. Um, so with Kevin as our representative uh, for writing, so up on the screen over here we have uh, two of the pages. We're going to run through, it's basically kind of one montage from an episode that Mr. Sullivan wrote. Um, and so we'll kind of run through that part of the process. We don't, we're not just going to focus on those two pages of script. Um, but Kevin, I know for you, with uh, like you've worked on a couple shows, so how is the writing process different on The Loud House? Um, when I started at Nick, uh, it was kind of a more individual process. The writer kind of came up with the idea and then kind of went off and did it on their own. Uh, the Loud House is, is written very much like a live action sitcom in that we're in the room together all day long, uh, breaking stories together, uh, reviewing scripts and pieces and outlines together. Nothing uh, goes in without every writer in the room contributing to it in some way. So it's much more a collective effort. The writers will go off and write each stage of the process on their own, premise, outline, and first draft. <coughs> but everything then is reviewed by the team and most times Chris collectively. Awesome. Uh, and I actually skipped over my own notes, and I meant to start. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, so Chris, I think, uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm sure most of you do know, The Loud House actually started as a short at Nickelodeon. Um, so do you want to talk just really quick about the process of developing a short into a series? Sure. 
Uh, this is a story I've told a lot of times. Uh, so the original conceit for the Loud House originally was a boy rabbit with 25 sisters. The joke was, you know, rabbits multiply. That's why, we, that's why Lincoln has the toy rabbit on his bed. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yes. um, but it, uh, it, it came to the attention of one of the executives there who suggested quite wisely to make them human. And the Loud House came out of that. And it's a pretty simple premise when you say a boy with 10 sisters, it conjures up immediately who his enemies are going to be in the house and kind of what the stories are going to be about. So it, it wasn't a difficult, what we call a high concept idea, like, you know, uh, students on a school on the moon or something, but it just was like, you get it. Um, and so the, the short, which was three minutes long, was really the same type of writing structure as 11 minutes long, which is the character has a need or a want, he or she goes after it, there's at the midpoint where they get what they want, and then just like living in any household, you have to deal with consequences of getting what you want. If you've got siblings, you know what that means. Yeah. Hey, he got more than me. And it's all, yeah. you know, that's a story right there. Um, so with the short, Lincoln had to get to the bathroom um, down the hall through the, the chaos of, of his sisters. And halfway through the cartoon, he gets to the bathroom. But lo and behold, his older sister stops him. And so the cartoon takes a twist there and finishes out by him having a plan, which I think is the, the mainstay of Lincoln's character, right, is that he's the man with the plan. He's um, resourceful, I like that in the character. <laughs> he's not dumb like most cartoon boys, Lincoln used his head. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, kids. Uh, anyway, so it really is just a smaller version of what the series became, and it was kind of the, uh, the template on which we write the stories, correct? Yeah. And so if you want to talk about this particular structure, we could talk about the the wants and the needs, the setup. Yeah. I, I, I should also point out, when I joined the show, I'm, I was coming off of... Uh, Fairly Odd Parents and Tough Puppy with Butch Harmon. There was an average kid. There was no structure. Uh, so getting used to uh, a midpoint and, and uh, a four-act structure, I, I resisted it for a long time. It took a while for me to really uh, get into that. But it works completely. And we in the writer's room can always tell if the story is working or not working by applying that structure. Um, so basically, the episode here is uh, Ellis for Love which was actually our story editor, Mike Rubiner's idea. I know on the title card it says Darren, but Whoops. it was Mike's. Um, and I remember thinking, I don't know how we're gonna do this episode. I honestly don't. Um, and the fear that we had was that it was just going to be too talky, too many sisters talking about who they have crushes on. So it really just became a challenge, like how do we do this visually and how do we make it fun? We have a lot of information. Whenever you have to introduce almost 10 new characters, um, it becomes very difficult when you have only 16 pages. Um, so yeah, so it really just, we realized, take a lot of the dialogue out and just show a lot of montages of each of the sisters with the guy that they have a crush on, um, which kind of it made it good. I named two of the characters in the episode after a niece and a nephew of mine, and then had to go back and tell them, you have no dialogue. We cut it, we cut it. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. So, Aww. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, so that's basically, that was the challenge of the episode, and this one has a weird structure because I don't know that there is a midpoint. I think the last letter shows up at the midpoint, right? That might the be brown it. Hair. The brown hairs, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there were different challenges in how do we eliminate uh, different sisters, and how do we how do we get them to know what they should be doing at this point? And it's always nice to find a character who can get you exposition without it sounding like exposition. In this case, it was Lucy having read vampire novels and knowing about romantics, knowing the exact process. Um, so that made that shorthand very easy. Um, and then the thing that we loved most about the episode was it gave us a chance to explore mom and dad, and we don't always get to do that. Lizzie and Rita, I love those characters. Yeah, yeah uh, they're hilarious. And to see them younger, mom as a crossing guard and dad as a, as a <laughs> yeah, um, was fantastic. So it was just realizing we had all of this great material and trying to figure out a way to get it into an 11 minute script. Uh, and I think a good segue into the, the next stage of our uh, process is that idea of introducing 10 new characters, because when we have episodes that introduce 10 new characters, usually it's boarded by Jordan Koch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, like, uh, no, more. next on the phase, like, we uh, obviously we did one you know, screen, we don't really have enough space to show the 200 some odd panels that it takes to make those two pages. But, uh, this is a, some samples of uh, Jordan's thumbnails from this episode um, to sort of outline his process. Uh, but Jordan, I want, I want to know, uh, can you talk about the experience of um, boarding and being 
you know, funny visually, but within the confines and the constructs of a show, you know, because you can't really necessarily flex your own humor all the time. Um, so how do you sort of navigate, how do you do Savino funny? <laughs> um, I don't know. One of my favorite things about the about boarding and about the six of us, six, there's six storyboard artists on the show, is um, if you don't see who boarded it at the beginning and you just watch the show, um, and this is a testament to Kevin and all the writers, but all the characters consistently act the same way and there's certain things that Lincoln does and things that he wouldn't do and all six of us are sort of able to tap into that. So. The difference is there's six of us playing Lincoln as opposed to in a sitcom when you have one character that plays one character. Um, and it's really kind of fun to see. I mean, every, each one of us have little things that our Lincolns do, um, but overall, you know, he still reacts the same way if one of his sisters says something. And that's one of my favorite things about the collaborative process, even though we each storyboard our own episode. Um, but, I mean, Sean, to answer your question, I mean, you said it's script driven, so we get the script from our writers, and then uh, you go through and you do all these little scribbles to figure out visually what you're reading, how that's going to look on the screen. Um, and you sort of figure everything out, and we have about a week to do this, and that's, that's the week where you try to find answers to any questions that you have and try to make sense of this whole thing. Because um, really, after that week, after you do all these little drawings, you just spend the next couple of weeks redrawing them and fleshing things out and and this is like this is the only week out of the entire time where you don't have to sit at a desk so you can sit on a sofa or you can sit in the back of your car you can do whatever you want uh and just come up with this for the very first time you know like from here on out i will always draw that little teddy bear in that same spot until the episode's over um and this is sort of like the first time you sort of like get let it out of the cage and you can just fly and just think of whatever you want to do with the episode. Um, but I, I, I kind of look at it like you just sort of fill in fill in the gaps. You know, the writers are great at giving us a little bit of slack on the leash. So it'll say, you know, Lincoln runs down the hallway or an example of something that's a little more open-ended. They don't specifically say Lincoln goes down the steps, and by going down the steps, we mean he slides down the banister, hops off, and then jumps out of the, you know, skips out of the house. They don't say that. They just said Lincoln goes downstairs. And then if you have room to sort of play with that and make it a little more fun and visually interesting to see, as opposed to him running down each step, then that's that's what our job. That's what we do. Well, and I think Jordan gave me a really good example of, of that and sort of how the writers and the board artists can all play together um, within the humor of the show. And an example of that actually happens on the next page of design. Uh, right there in the middle, uh, Jordan was describing that EmbalmCon was actually written into the script. So that is a regular <laughs> joke. <clears throat> but the R.I. Pete's was Jordan's, you know, effort and attempt to, like, make his own contribution to, you know, Morbid humor, I guess. Well, it's kind of like it's 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 a give and take. It's like the writer set something up, and then you see how you you're like, oh, in BombCon's hilarious. Like, what a great like convention for Lucy to go to. Um, <laughs> and then my job, and then, like in the script, the script said she walks past all these boots, and you know, so you're like, oh, I was just handed this gold thing of what is a bom in BombCon. Uh, and I was like, well, what kind of things would be at this place, you know, and then that's where I start to think about things and see where I can add more to that simple concept. Awesome. So uh, the next stage within our process is is design. Well, I guess the, one of the next stages involves my team, which is the production team, where we look at the episodes and sort of help determine, uh, along with Amanda, what needs to be drawn. For those of you who are not familiar with the animation process, we have to actually draw out all of the characters, props, backgrounds, and things that are needed so that our animation studio knows what they're supposed to look like. Um, and so that is what Amanda oversees, um, and that includes black and white, and then uh, the question that I have for Amanda focuses a little more on the color realm. Because um, like, Amanda is a color guru. I love that, um, very colorful. Yeah, that's great. So, so Amanda, I want to know what the, uh, what's the philosophy when it comes to color on the Loud House? Like, how do you approach making it um, well it's similar in design and also um, kind of goes along with what Jordan was saying is you know Jordan will take the the script and um, 
put his own put his own thoughts to to clarify those ideas that are in the script. And we do the same thing. So we take the boards and we try to support um, support those ideas and tell those things visually in a clear um, and fun way. And so it's the same thing with color. You know, we're choosing. Our choices are based on you know the step that comes before to make sure that you guys as viewers can see clearly the jokes that are trying to be told through writing and through boarding and um, make them hopefully even funnier in, in, in design. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> so after while design is happening, these two things actually happen concurrently, we get into the world of animatics, um, which is where we've actually recorded the voice actors and uh, it is put together by an editor and then overseen either by uh, Chris or our Star Wars supervisor, Kyle. Um, and they oversee the editing of the animatic, which will let the animation studio know exactly what the timing is for the episode. So we've taken uh, a minute of the animatic and we'll be able to see it as the animatic, which is Jordan's storyboards put together with the audio. Uh, and then we'll be able to see the final animation so you guys can kind of see that process. <laughs> I, like, I like that Letty's boyfriend. He looks kind of cool. Bob <laughs> 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 This is that that was a good I like this. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then Chris, I don't know if you want to address quickly like the, that process of animatic editing and kind of what the purpose is behind that and what you're trying to provide the animation studio. Can I can I just say one thing sure. about that before we start? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. A perfect example of the collaboration between the writer and the board artist is when spitting into her hand and shaking the hand was in the script, but the Lisa explosion where the kid Squeegees her glasses was not. No. So it, no. Yeah, I, I, I just assumed it was all there. I'm happy to take credit for it, but no, it was. Uh, just to piggyback on something you said about the step coming before you, I think one of the philosophies on the show, and it's not just our show, but hopefully every show, the script is the foundation of the entire episode, and if it's not there, we're just passing the problems on down the road, right? And that's the one thing we want to avoid. So. In writing, the, the, well, let's just say that 95% of the script is 95% solid, and that leaves room for the board artist to embellish, because the writer can't know, visually, when you're drawing something out, the, the kinds of opportunities that can arise when you are seeing the, the story unfold before you. So that's where Jordan has the opportunity to add those kinds of jokes, and that is fully part of the production process to um, make the step that came before you better, but make the step that comes after you easier. So everybody's job uh, is from from the moment the idea comes up to the moment we deliver it, every step of the way we're trying to continue telling the story uh, verbally, visually, color, and scenery, and props, etc. And even into the animatic, which comes timing. Um, the An animatic is kind of, uh, I'm sure there's students here that know, but um, it's fake timing. It's not exactly, if a, if a character is supposed to walk across the screen in the animatic, it might be 24 frames, because that feels right. But then an animator gets those 24 frames to animate, and it's like way too short for them, and they need more time to do it, or vice versa. Um, so the animatic is just to give a sense of what the cartoon should feel like when you're watching it, and the animators go, okay, I see they wanted the character to move through that scene fast, so I will animate through fast. So the, the timing that comes back from animation is not always gonna be the exact same length that you're gonna see in the animatic, and it's just a sense of feeling, how the cartoon's going to play out. I think this one had Lots of dialogue, and the dialogue takes, tends to dictate how fast things are going to move through the scene just because um, that's what's filling the time. But when there's scenes where there's um, no dialogue and just action, 
that's where when we sit down with the animatic editor, we get to time those panels out. <coughs> Jordan tends to draw a lot of panels. He's an animator, yeah, so really yeah, um, which is great for us because then we can really play with how a character is moving downstairs, down the banister, and, and skipping out the door or whatever it is, uh, which is great. It just gives us one extra step in order to con con continue telling the story, and continue making the jokes funnier, and have the play funnier um, every step of the way. And when, conversely, when it gets to animation, and the animation comes back to us. It plays pretty well, and we're in a really fortunate position in this particular show in editing. It's how do we cut the 15 extra seconds that are out of this down to our, our um, time that we're supposed to cut it to, 1045. And if we have 11 minutes of animation, that's a classy problem to have when you're just figuring out how much to cut out of it. There have been shows that I've worked on where we're actually trying to figure out what the story is when the show comes back. And that is a really late in the game to be trying to figure out the story. So, um, it does. It starts with writing, and it's just trying to make every step along the way make the episode better, but also make it easier for the people who come after you. The end. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, to that, I mean, we've also, I mean, we've, we're working on season three right now, and so we've seen a bunch of these come through, and we always watch the animatics when, and we see, like, all your best stuff got cut out. And all of a sudden, you've seen it happen enough that... I mean, you, you sort of look back, and now now when you look at a script and you go to storyboard something out, you start to think, like, if you, if you know this is going to be a bigger episode and stuff's going to have to be cut to get it down to 11 minutes, you can start to think of, oh, I, I want to do this, but this is going to get cut, so I'm not, you know, and you can start to think of that ahead of time, and then that way it just makes it easier, like you said, it makes it easier down the line. Well, that's one of the things, too, that I think from an objective, like, as objective as I can be still working on the show, um, <clears throat> but watching the process is that Chris especially has a lot of trust in the team that has been built on the Loud House, um, and in the team that we have at Jamical that does the animation, and so that, that idea of, you know, setting up the person after you for success, but also building on what came before you, there's, like, everyone sort of trusts that the next person is going to, like, knock it out of the park, um, and, and I think that that, you know, uh, speaks in the product. Um, and speaking of, we're going to jump to the animation. So this is that that same montage from Jane. Speak for any of us. I like it here. <laughs> awesome. uh, and I think that uh, unless there's anything else that anyone on the panel, yeah. well, I just wanted to just to continue on with that is um, you know as you saw the animatic, it was a little bit tighter than what the animatic played. So I like that. Picture back. Very you know, nice. Art, a great. I love the work that Jamfield did on it. They're amazing, right? I, I would have preferred uh, Mercury Filmwork, thanks to Wander, but oh uh, <laughs> well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, the, it's again, it's, a, it's showing that every step of the way it makes it better. So when the animation came back, that scene played really long, and instead of cutting things out, we tightened it up. Um, I think Lincoln's cheering is gone, and a couple of other things, but we break the, the extra punch. Um, it's just to make it play better, so every step of the way you're trying to continue telling the story and making the jokes convey as best as you can. Uh, and then again, it's a, it's a classic problem to have, but when a show comes back and it's a little bit long, the, having the tough part be figuring out what part of this show to cut out because every part is so good is a great place to be when you're in that part of production. <laughs> well, and also one change that was really subtle, which is interesting as far as like story goes, is in the script and in the board, <clears throat> the montage uh, Luna is last, so Lily is before Luna. 
Um, but then in editing that was changed so as not to sort of bury the lead of yeah. like, you know, what the episode is. So like there's, it's really interesting like what such small adjustments can actually do for a story. And it's things you don't necessarily realize until you see it in that visual uh, space. All right, you're always thinking about the story. And I think one of the things that we didn't realize how good it was going to be was, was the reveal of Sam when we played, when we pitched, oh. the, uh, when we pitched <laughs> the storyboard, when you pitched the storyboard to the crew and it was that, that gasp at the end. It's like, oh, well that's, Really working well. So I you like go that. back and hide her a little You'd bit. You'd be more. I like you exploring those options. There's another word for it. I forgot, but it was a really good word. Like, I like I like when you could use real life political social yeah. elements to without feel like it's beefy. That's right. I like so that. those, those are those are real things that happen in the real world. Um, anyway, so yeah, so it was a decision to make to kind of bury that in in the montage a little bit, ending with the cute Lily really hugging the bear each time with a nice. Um, I think it was a cute way to wrap up each of those montages, but it was more. I think Jordan did a great job of hiding Sam as Luna's, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, um, <laughs> Sam as Luna's crush rather than the guy that's sitting in front of her every time. So um, it, 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 in hindsight, you go back and like, oh yeah, Sam was in all of those shots, but the guy in between kind of, kind of made you think automatically that it was the guy that she was into. So I, it made that ending sequence. Even yeah, I wanted it to be that, like, if you went back and watched it a second time, it was, like, all right there the whole time, but you don't know that when you watch it the first time. Awesome, cool. Well, uh, we still have plenty of time, yeah. so we're going to jump. Someone said there was plenty of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we're going to do this. We can run around. Oh, all right. So put a line up or something. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hi, good. Okay, so um, I do storyboards as well, and uh, Loud House, I have to say my favorite thing about the Loud House is that you guys are able to handle so many characters all at once, and I mean, normally a cartoon will have like maybe three or four main characters at a time. I don't know if this is too loud. Is this too loud? It's all right. It's okay. It's all right. Okay, so my question is, uh, when you guys were first making the show, uh, what challenges were you able to make that were able to make you guys handle so many lead characters at once? Well, you storyboard that. Kevin, you don't, you're not limited by character and writing, right? You... When, when we started, when I joined the show, they were 13 episodes in already, and I had a cheat sheet in the writer's room with each sister's name and two words that described them, and someone would pitch a joke, and I'd be like, wait, which one was that? Um, and then I missed the whole thing completely. Um, so we did start where they, the characters were a type, so you knew Luna was the rock star, and Lola was the princess. Um, but over time, as we've gotten to know them better, that's kind of, they've evolved. The characters have become much more than just an archetype. And that's, and we, yet we still know exactly how each one of them would respond in a situation. So that was just gonna say, because one of my things that I noticed a while ago was if you would read the script, but take out the character names mm -hmm. and just see the dialogue, you'd pretty much be able to figure out who was saying what. And that's, that's, I mean, to Chris, that's great characters, to the writers, that's great dialogue. Um, you know, you almost don't even need to see that it's a Lucy line to know, oh, Lucy would say that. Out of 11 of them, she, only Lucy would talk like that, or only Luna would talk like that. And that, I think, is, I mean, when we get that, when the storyboard artists get that, that's like, that's amazing, you know? It makes it so clear. To dig deeper on your question, though, like when you've got 13 characters in a scene, you know. Um, that you know, you could treat the sisters as, as a whole. Sometimes you just you'll just draw like a, a hill shape in the, in the storyboard panel with ten circles in it, and that represents the sisters. And it's Lincoln, and you get this sense of like this big mass of characters versus Lincoln in this shot. So you feel, hey, that's pretty good. So you feel you feel you feel yourself <laughs> against it in there. The details of drawing them and composing them as as um, a mass of sisters with but with all their detail that's tough to do. And I you know. Hats off to the board artists who do it week after week. Um, but it is a challenge, and we know that you can't have all 13 characters running around in every single scene in every episode uh, jam filled with kills. So <laughs> we do give a sense that there's always this chaos, that the sisters in the, in the, are always around in the house, but then we can do a scene between Lincoln and Lindsay, for example, and know that they're not alone, know that those characters are around. So. Um, establishing that those characters were always there allows us to take that step away but still feel like that presence of all the characters within the house is not even showing um, a messy floor or you know a, a detail of 
clothing thrown somewhere, or a ball, or um, one of the props that the characters use all the time is just around. You, you, you sense that they're still there, but it allows us to tell stories with only the two or three characters that are can I, available. Can I uh, add to that by like talking about <coughs> it a bit earlier yet? I don't Whoa! A lot. Yes! Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, there was an episode... Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, episode of production now where Lincoln realizes if he has a friend over, he gets special benefits. Um, <laughs> so he makes sure Clyde is there all the time. And then the sisters catch on to it, and they each bring a friend over, and it levels the playing field again. So Lincoln invites a second friend over. And the oh. numbers keep escalating. Oh. And we're in the writer's room writing the script, and our story editor is like, Amanda is going to rip our heads off. <laughs> 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 so we're going to get the bad guy in the first seven minutes. We say you're always considering the next step in the process, but right. sometimes. Sometimes you're considering it in blind panic. <laughs> we took great oh steps God. to write this. <laughs> you don't see how many people are in the Loud House, just so that we didn't have to have a room with 65 people in it. And I wrote the episode and lived in fear of it, but luckily Jordan got the board. Well, yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, it sort of builds to the point where, like Kevin said, like they start to catch on, like if you have a friend over, you get special privileges. Um, then they catch on that if you have one more friend over than somebody else, you still get special privilege. So it builds, so somebody invites four people over, but then somebody invites five. And then another one of the 11 invites six. And it builds until I think one of them brings 11 people over and to, to beat out the one who has 10 people over. And I think in the script it was like six friends over from there until the 11 it was all it was exterior shots. yeah they just the script just said we see out shots of outside of the house and we just hear them saying all this and i said well don't you want to i mean like lucy was in there in that last group and uh luann was in there i was like well don't you want to see like lucy's like nine spooky friends. Yeah. I was like, I can't <laughs> so I, I wanted to draw so, them all. <laughs> we started an episode. We have a meeting with Chris, and I, I said, "Oh, this is gonna sound dumb, uh, but can I? Can we show them all? Because and you know, can we do that?" And he said, "Yeah, go ahead." So I, you know part of my life insurance and uh, <laughs> drew all of them and, and fixed, filled it all in it. And I think it's, I think it's fun to see like this giant, because there was one point where there's like 24 kids in my house, you know, and I could never do math, but when you have 11 kids and you're like, oh, they each have a friend over here, like that's 22. Like immediately you know exactly, you know, and that can multiply really quickly. And they're not rabbits, but like, no, you did a great job of that was fun. That distinguishing was all of the, group, the friend group. Well, that's just another point we wanted to make earlier is that we have the fortunate kind of the writers have this groove that's going on, and we're always about three or four scripts ahead of when it's handed out to board artists. And because we know each other well, we know the strengths and weaknesses, we can hand a script to a board artist based on what their strengths are. And I think that that particular script went to Jordan because he's the guy to do it. And he did it in a way that was kind of borrowing almost on like Hanna Barbera. Like it's done so simple and yet so effective to show all those characters in there. It doesn't have to be everybody running around all at once. With one drawing, one scene of showing Lucy's six friends over at the house, you, you understand what, what's trying to be conveyed in there. I think it's, it, it was the perfect pairing of writer, board, artist in that particular instance. And another thing to what you were saying about boarding just the 11 kids, just in a regular episode. Um, I mean, they're, the youngest is 15 months old, and the oldest is older than 17 and um <laughs> which means some of them are taller than others you know so the tall ones go in the back the shorter ones go in the front someone holds the baby so she gets up higher and if you're running out of room you you just think of the character well lucy wouldn't want to be seen anyway so you tuck her off to the side that's one less um and you sort of have all these cheats where it, depending on what scene it is if, if they don't all have to be there like chris said um you can sort of cheat it if you take i don't know Five of them, it kind of feels like they're all there anyway, you know? And if you quickly move on, that's like six you didn't have to draw, you know? So you sort of figure out, you don't always have to have them all there, but um, because they're not all the same height, um, it makes it kind of fun to sort of figure out who's gonna go where, and usually one of them has a line, which means they have to be closer to Lincoln, and uh, so it's fun to sort of figure out and sort of puzzle piece them together, who's gonna go where. Why is Lincoln's hair white? Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, why is it white? Uh, the, the technical reason, and, and I'm sure there'll be a story about it one day, we just haven't cracked it yet, and I just don't think it's time to tell a story about why his hair is white, but we plant that seed through many episodes of people oh wanting to know as well. Uh, but if you take a step back in the development of the show, this is not the classy answer, it's just the real answer, is you want to make a character iconic, right? You want him or her to stand out in some way from the sea of other cartoon characters out there. I've worked on a lot of shows, and the main character was a redhead, and I worked on a show where the main character was blonde. I worked on a show where they had brown hair, and you start to wonder, like, how am I going to make my character stand out from all these other amazing characters that exist in history? So for me, white was the only answer. Not off-white, not slightly yellow, but white. And now he's known as the kid with white hair, and I think that that kind of proves the point that when you're making an iconic character, you do things to make sure that they stand out amongst all the other cartoon characters out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not the fun answer, but you'll get, you'll get a fun <laughs> answer sooner or sooner. <laughs> no, that being said, there's a, well, you can take that. Um, this Instagram account surfaced uh, yes. where yes. Someone, yes. someone takes photos of uh, people in public that have white hair and are wearing an orange polo shirt. And, <laughs> and they're like, oh, yes. that, that looks um, like exactly like Lincoln Loud, you know? And I think it's that just, so I mean, to Chris's design, it's it's like, exactly, yeah, I he's got an orange that. polo shirt and he's got white hair that can only be one little kid. Even though it's like a six year old guy. I think one of those is Kevin from Halloween like two years ago. Yeah, the Loud House Absolutely. crew will dress up on Halloween. Oh and my gosh. Each, each uh, uh, female crew member will go as a different sister, leaving Lincoln wide open. Yeah. Do I have an orange polo shirt and a white wig? It's preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda's an amazing mom. <laughs> Yeah, I have a few things I'd like to say. <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, first of all, I know why Lincoln has white hair. Ooh, no. He has poliosis. Oh. Oh. Okay. Do you even know what that is? <laughs> poliosis is a hereditary disease of albinism. Mm. Mm. And everyone assumes that um, Lincoln got his hair from Pop Pop, and well. Coincidentally, a, a while ago, I I found this article about this baby girl who who had a white patch of hair, and and her mother also had that same patch of hair. And well, that seeing that made me think, oh my God, Lincoln has poliosis. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I actually have lots more. I have a whole line of them all. Oh, she's going to come up here. Yeah. Oh. It's okay. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, they're not in there. Well, let's get another question. Yeah, yeah. I'll do that. I'll wait till you're done. I have many questions. So I'll wait till next question is done. Lid. Oh, right. me or Lid or Lars? Because there's Lid. Okay, anyways. All right, how are you doing, guys? Hi. <laughs> um, so I, I noticed that um, that there are secondary characters in the show that get a recurring role back. Like, for example, Sam was going to come back soon. There's also um, the best friends of Lincoln, um, Rusty, uh, Liam, and... What's it, Zach? Yeah, there you go. Are there any other chances that the other secondary characters that have been shown in the Loud House will be coming back? Yeah, um, you know, with, with, with Rusty and Zach and Liam, they were only supposed to be in the one episode that... Above the bike. Yeah, and um, what happens is they... You know, the writers will kind of um, become attached to a certain character. For some reason, everyone loved Rusty, and he was kind of... Lincoln's enemy in that episode, but we made him a pal. And that's why they all have red hair. They were never supposed to all be a gang together, but mm. here, here they are. Um, <laughs> and much to your chagrin, right? You, yeah, you, oh. The red hair, right? You're going to change. Yeah, <laughs> so the red hair. <laughs> I'll answer the question. Okay. <laughs> so these, uh, these characters were created one at a time and came through the design pipeline. And so we started um, giving them red hair just kind of coincidentally, and now they're this pack. <laughs> this pack of redheads? <laughs> the red hair. The ginger squad, right? The ginger yeah. squad. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think we definitely will see other characters come through. And you'll even see, you know, they're, like as a crew, we kind of have some inside jokes about some of the characters, like 
Have you noticed the farmer everywhere? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, we have a story about the farmer. Uh, <laughs> with the secondary characters, it's, you know, somebody will fall in love with one. And, and, and Lucy has her friend Haiku that she tried to set up with, with Lincoln. And Haiku comes back. And then in one scene where she was in her... Um, was that Mortuary School photo. Club? School photo, yeah. Um, there were some other characters that were designed that uh, Kat Ketchum had designed, and like those are really great. We should bring those back. And I think that's something that evolves with with the shows. Like, yeah, it used to focus all around Lincoln and his sisters, and then it was the whole family had their own episodes, and we got to dig deeper on Lincoln's friends. And like, well, who are the other friends in with uh, within um, the sisters? So we wanted to explore more of them. So some of those characters you've seen once. And an episode will probably be <coughs> brought back as characters. Carol, Carol Pingree is going to make a, a, oh. an appearance. And, um, it's a great episode, directed by the one sitting to my left. Um, <laughs> directed by Amanda Rinda? Yeah! <laughs> I didn't know he was a director. <laughs> Art director. You know what? I, we empower everybody on the crew to kind of... Um, uh, Mo kind of Mo move up in their, with their jobs. Yeah. Oh yeah, why not, so, right? So like, so like maybe if I were to get a job on your show, I'd be my pass. That's right. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Yeah, you can get the question now. I have a question also. Um, so, sorry. Aside from, um, is this thing? Yeah, it's working here. So aside from L is for love, and you know that moment where you um, introduce Luna as a bisexual, what would you say is um, like your proudest moment in terms of you know an episode or moment of the Loud House you made? Like you know um, you've made you've made amazing episodes. You've you've made amazing moments. You know surprising even. But aside from L is for love. What would you say is an episode or a moment that you feel the most proud of besides Ellis for Love? Goodness, that's a good question. I'm sure we, well, we all have answers that are, are going to be different. And in those moments in particular, I think I'm more proud of those kinds of moments when we do our best to downplay those moments. When we show Luna and Sam, when we show Clyde's parents, when we show in um, in the Relative Chaos episodes that one of their brothers has Down syndrome, we don't say, hey, look at this character has Down syndrome. We just let him be a character in the show. And he's the sweetest character in the entire um, Yeah, I think I, I love that. Um, I got you. And, and so, it, it, to me, it, I, I feel most proud about those, those particular moments because they aren't moments. And we succeeded in making them normal. Uh, and that is, that is what I think hopefully comes across. Uh, and, you know, Luna, bisexual. The, the point there is that everybody can make Luna what they want her to be, but Luna loves everybody, and that's kind of what we're really trying to convey. You see her, she's in love with... Um, you. Tutor, like you. She had it for you. She had it for you. And, and, you know, it could be you one week, or like Sam the next, um, but she's all about love and Zen and you know, love everything. Uh, and that's what we're trying to convey, but we're not trying to shove it down anyone's throat. Mm -hmm. It's like you can yeah. be who you want to be, and it doesn't have to be a thing, it's just you. And that's, I think Kevin did an excellent job of conveying that with both Clyde's dads and uh, Sam in that particular episode. But even, you know, we make big moments. I, I, the hair on my neck stands up every time Rita and, and, and Lynn and Senior show their faces in the Christmas episode. Like, oh, yeah. there's that moment where there's presents drop, and you're not expecting it. You can only do that once, right? We can't reveal their faces again and get the same reaction. But that's a culmination of everything leading up to that moment and then dropping, their, dropping down those presents and seeing their faces. And then that little Christmas carol starts up right on that, right on that beat. Like, those moments when you can get uh, like a reaction that's emotional in, in, a, in a cartoon, to me, are the best ones. Yeah, it should be a funny cartoon, and it should be uh, entertaining, but the, there's no reason why you can't make a character or an audience member cry watching a cartoon. There's no rule. So in that moment, I always feel like this swell of, of pride and, and emotion is like, we succeeded in hiding the family that whole time, or the parents that whole time, and then to finally reveal it, almost like a Christmas present to the people watching. Because um, we were at a point where we couldn't hide them anymore, but that was the moment that we, we all felt was like, this is the moment to, to reveal their faces. And I'm proud of that moment. Yeah.
Nice. Oh, Chris, I have many questions. Oh, okay. I think uh, we're going to go back to... Um, my name is Amiri. Yeah, so... There's been something that I've been wondering for quite a while. And, it, and it's confused me. Uh-oh. People say that... 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 That Luna loves Sam. Has a crush on Sam sexually, but I think she has a crush on her because she's awesome because my, my friend from school wrote in my yearbook, I love you, and then in the the next year, she wrote a message saying, you are awesome. So that, so remembering that makes me wonder, does Luna love Sam sexually, or... <laughs> 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 whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, Mary, but a little deep. <laughs> she's 15, and so I think a lot of people automatically assume that because she has affection for um, someone else that we're talking about in a sexual way, but she is 15, and we have to be careful how we convey that. Um, I think that you can have a crush on anybody, like you said, because someone's awesome, because she's a good guitar player, because she can do the things she can't, because and they love what, the things they and love. And that's why I think Luna likes Sam. Yes, I agree with you. Okay, Chris. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, three things. Okay. <laughs> okay make it. One. We, uh, we've got time. You're all right. So, uh, first off, what's it, what's it, what, how do you, what, what's, what's your, what, I love your dialogue aesthetic, how you take cues from old cartoonists like yeah, I, obviously because Sarah from Paul and her pals is a great interest. That's where you named the Fat Cliff and, and everything looks like it's out of uh, old Chris Derek June. But you, what about Uderzo? And Uderzo from Asterix. That, that'd be a good reference. Uh, was there a question in there? Yeah, a sorry. What was the question? I missed that. A sorry, I'm sorry. That's okay. A thing like, I love your aesthetic references like Cliff Starrett, uh, you, I'm trying to think of what, you reference Herge and uh, Tintin and you reference also... Uh, the uh, asterisk. I mean, asterisk. Okay, that's the part I missed. Um, the 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 whole. You know, I loved comics growing up, and that's kind of where I learned to draw was copying comics. Um, so it's kind of an homage, just personally to me. But there's also a feeling that reading comics gives you every Sunday, opening up the Sunday paper and seeing familiar characters, and you feel like you're invited, and they're always going to be the same, and they're always going to be there. And that's kind of, kind of what we wanted for the Loud House was a sense of feeling. Homey. Invited and warm and the home, homey. and they're always going to be there for you and always be the same characters for you. Um, so for me to to reference those characters, I've lost it. For me to reference those characters, personal, um, but I think it also conveys something, whether subconsciously or not, uh, to to the viewer that is uh, hopefully comes across. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there are no out and out references to uh, Tintin or to Asterix. Um, Asterix. Certainly. Um, uh, Gaston uh, from um, Gaston Lagaffe. Yeah, it, definitely influenced by that, and and those are people I look up to as like I aspire to be to be as good as those. Or cartoons. even like have Paul Perkins or Asher for the original Polly comic appear at one point. Well, uh, you know, as a Mr. Joke. Grouse is kind of based slightly on Paul. If you, if you look close. So what's the what's the voice cast like? I know it's, I love I love I I can't, I'm, I'm kind of getting used to Colin D purely because. He sounds younger than Grant Palmer because Grant aged up over the fourth season one. Yeah. But but we called to go. He he thought he younger, but it was actually kind of fitting in a way. Grant and, and, and of course you should have a joke where <laughs> Catherine, you know Catherine, who was right, Lori, was also Padme. Have a Star Wars joke or two. Oh, uh, we're not allowed to talk about Star Wars in Nickelodeon. But it's yeah, funny because like. That's a Disney joke. Like, a couple things about other actors. What's it like working with Jeff Bennett? I know he's a lot of episodes like. Well, Jeff is great. He's, he's he not only has funny voices, and there's a reason why you hear his voice everywhere. Is because he's good. Yeah. How about um, oh, he? He does great voices, but he also gets a joke, and he can see a line and bring humor to it that possibly wasn't even in it to begin with. But he knows it's a cartoon, and he knows how to have fun. Um, he's Nick Swagger, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I show you. Or like, how about how about getting to, Jill's wife Tom on the show? Tom Kenny would be great. Eric Bowser, come on, Richard. How about Jim oh, Chummings and Charlie Adler? Will they be on the show at one point? Eventually, you know. We, I love Jim. We have <laughs> very few opportunities for secondary characters because there are already so many. Yeah, well, like yeah, I love to hear Maurice Lamarche. I met Maurice at an improv club with, with with John Lamarge and Billy West. I love your like John does a great job, Mr. Grouse. And I, I just realized my friend Jake would love this. 
I tell him that John probably based his voice for Flip, the gas station guy, off of Chris Farley. Yeah. Oh. I was going to let the year up. Jim. Great Chris Farley. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 do think, what do you think of Jim, Sean, and Marie? Do you like those guys? I love those guys. I love to hear like Jim play a Winnie the Pooh parody or even a or Charlie could play a mailman like a bored mailman like, uh, don't tell old me, Rocco, like Mr. Bigot. Right? Oh. So, sorry. Or Maurice could do like a brain surgery. <laughs> Orson Welles at one point. He could do Orson Welles in a movie someone's watching. We'll write that or, down. The Maurice LaMarche could, could be like, I love Maurice. He's a third question. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> I didn't ask you a second. I was going to say, like, uh, did, were you. Wait, I was going to say, when, when Grant was wrapping up as Colin, or as Lincoln, I could not imagine anyone else playing Lincoln, and it was really difficult to cast someone else, because Grant yeah, yeah. was the character. And we had to let Colin, we had to let him go. We had to let him just be who he was, and there was and one thing that we needed was to have a character be um, innocent enough that you root for him, strong enough that you are not worried for him, and funny enough that you can laugh at him. I'll say third one, hopefully, because I've, 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 like, I've, like, dragged all the artistic efforts out of you guys, but... No thinking of it. What, what made you go to Jamfield, as opposed to, say, uh... Right, we were going to talk about Mercury. To Mercury <laughs> Filmworks, who's done some great work. Uh, the, truth be told, I went to Mercury first. Really? Uh, for the short, they were very busy with a show called Wander Over Yonder. So oh! oh. 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 i get revenge on, on Craig, though. Oh. Have, have a joke called okay. a character no, called Lard Heater. Lard Heater. <laughs> get it? Get it? Uh, thank you, Chris. Nice talking thank to you. you. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. I already. <laughs> hey, guys. Is this on? Oh, I just actually have a lot of Okay, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, question is for Jordan and Kevin. How long. Well, Kevin first, how long does it take to write an episode? And then how long does it take to board it? Uh, to write it, uh, we... Um, probably about six weeks to do a premise, an outline, and a first draft. For the whole 30 or the 11? 11. 11. Okay. 11. Um, six to seven weeks. Because we'll, we'll end up doing a first draft, we'll get notes back from the network, and then a second draft, and sometimes even if the network approves it at second draft, we'll go back and punch it a third time. So that takes about seven weeks uh, from the moment we come in with an idea to the time we throw it to journal. And it's the same about for storyboards. It's about six to seven. Uh, we have a week to do thumbnails like what you saw. Um, we have three weeks to sort of just rough out the entire episode, all 11 minutes. Um, we have two weeks to then go back and like tie it down and make sure that all the details are there and you know who which character is which. Um, and then after I think that's six, after those six weeks, then we pitch that to the studio. Um, and then after we pitch, if I get any notes from them, I have one more week to touch it up. And then at the end of the seventh week, I let it go. And then it goes to Amanda and everybody else takes it. Actually, I'm excited because that's a schedule question. <laughs> All right. We are scheduled 10 weeks for writing. <laughs> Eight, right? What? We are scheduled <laughs> six weeks. Uh, that's 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 oh, that's well, then. Uh, Go faster. Go Thank you. Um, uh, my question is for Chris. Um, I've been watching the show uh, for a while, and uh, each character, uh, when I see them, they're very unique, very entertainment, and uh, it always, um, I had this question on the back of my head, are the characters uh, based on uh, real life uh, people, or was it like inspired by uh, my as you were doing the show? My sisters, who are some of the characters are named after, all think that they're named after the funny one, but they <laughs> <laughs> They're not as funny as they think they are, but um, no, you know, when when it was Twenty Five Sisters, they were all figured out. They're all B name characters. That's the only uh, letter that had enough female sounding name to me to fulfill that. And they each had an individual um, personality as well. And, and if if you know what those characters are, and then you see the Loud House characters, you say it took like two or three um, personalities and put them into one. Um, and created out of that, but it's it was based solely on Lincoln, 
uh, in choosing those 10. Uh, it was based solely on Lincoln's personality and which ones would clash the most with him. So if he's the man with the plan, you know, what types of characters would be the best ones to, to kind of pit against him or pit with him? Um, there are many characters within the show that you think he'd be full-time enemies with, but it turns out to be they're actually the, the closest. He and Lori ultimately are the closest um, in relationship to each other, even though they fight the most. Um, but the, um, as, as far as based on anybody in, in real life, no. It was just picking an individual trait that you could then connect yourself to. I mean, still people to this, this day who don't know the names of the characters will just say the rock star or the, or the sports uh -huh. one, which is great. It doesn't mean that the characters are one dimensional. It just is a great way to identify them. They've all, the writers have done an amazing job of digging deeper on who these characters are. And throughout second season and well into third, you're gonna see a whole lot more of who these characters are on a different level than what we have in scene. Uh -huh. Uh, this is a question for uh, Kevin. Um, you know, a lot is put into the episodes and not everything can make it. Yeah. Is there one scene that you wish could have been in, the, in any oh. episode oh. that could have been oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Now, we yeah. joke in the writer's room that we have, like, a file of, like, things we care, mostly characters we would like to, uh, to go back to. There was one recently that a joke was cut uh, for time. I can't remember what it is. Sammy was there. Um, but we, an episode that aired recently, um, where they meet uh, the Yates's, um, these Pitons. kids are all super perfect. Um, there's a scene at the end of it where they they say the sea turtle, and the labs are like, "Oh my god, we gotta say the turtle." Um, it was originally a dolphin, <laughs> and Kenny. And the writers loved Kenny the dolphin. We were like, "This is the best material." Kenny's been forever. And we said, "Dolphins don't live in lakes." We were like, oh wait, we're in Michigan. We can't have a dolphin. I called it. Kenny's on a high list of characters we really love. There's always, in every episode, I think every writer on the staff will be able to point to one thing that happens in design too. Because oh, yeah? we'll design something all the way and see it through the animation and then it goes and it gets sad. Everything gets sad. Every step of the list, everybody something. gets something. Yeah. Everybody loses a little. That's right. Yeah. Hey, um, this is the. This is for um, many other crew members of the uh, the lighthouse, and um, there was this one question I keep uh, having my head so far. Um, is there any possibility that Ronnie is going to be coming back? Coming back to the show? Mm -hmm. uh, she may have moved away, but she's still around. She's shown up in what four or five episodes yeah, since she's moved away, and there are more and more on the way as yep. well. Um, you know, I said earlier about characters having to deal with things that are real. And we all have to deal with friends that move away, and we felt she was the best one to actually have move away. We didn't know, I think we had already decided she was gonna move away before the show even started airing. That's how far ahead we were. Um, so we were writing her moving away, and nobody knew who she was. And by the time the show started coming out, we were finishing up that episode, Ronnie Ann became a really big character for Lincoln and within the, the viewing audience as well. So it's like, oh, the shippers we, rejoiced. Are, are we doing the right thing here? Or are we not doing the right thing here? But I think it is It is to kind of push the characters of the show to deal with more than what they would normally deal with, as well as the audience to understand, like, yeah, you do have friends who move away, but that does not mean they're out of your life. And so that's what's something we're trying to deal with. And she shows up on, um, like, face chat type thing. Uh, Lincoln goes to the city that she lives in now quite often. Uh, Lori does as well. And I, I was going to say that it also opens up a lot of stories for Lori and Bobby, which we hadn't even thought of until we were presented. Pushing their relationship, like yeah. stretching it to a place where it could break. Uh, but that's not. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't write that down. No. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for maybe one more. Uh, I have a quick question that I want to ask. Um, how is working on a show like different from like the past shows you worked on, Chris? Like, um, like Foster's and Powerpuff and Samurai Jack, and like long ago robot. in an Eastern uh, how, is it, how is it different um, working on this show than what was past? Uh, I think I think it, we can all answer this question. So I'm going to start with Amanda and let her talk about 
her past shows and what it's like working in a loud house and go down that way and that one. Since I've, I've, 91? How long have you been in the animation industry? Uh, now that you're saying 91 oh, shows. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, well, you know, for me, what makes the experience so special is the group of people that you're working with. Um, and, you know, to really come together and work together as a team and, you know, to visually be able to see people's work and identify it, um, you know, these are people that are not only your coworkers, but now also your friends. Because, you know, as an artist, as I'm sure many of you are, there's not one right answer to something. And it, it means that sometimes you really have to dig deep and you know, solve these problems and it takes a lot of your you know, emotions to get there. So you form these relationships with people and you know their drawings um, inside and out. And you know, each, each show that you work on, it's a different dynamic. So it becomes you know, not just a job, but really personal. And um, for me, that's that's really what I love about it. Jordan, not your first job, right? <laughs> not my first job. But it was my first like like big animation job. Um, from your previous jobs. Uh, <laughs> <Amazing. laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, I mean it was my in December. It'll be three years since I started on on the show, and I started as a storyboard revisionist on, and then I did that for a couple months, um, and then Chris moved me up to storyboarding, um, and so it was the first time I like actually got a chance to do something that was going to be made and come out, and you know, and um, and it's, it's Amanda said it best. You know, we we get to work with our friends now. You know, when we started, we didn't know anybody, and. Um, and, you know, Sean had mentioned earlier, Chris puts a lot of trust, not only into me, but everybody else on the show. Because um, he came up with these great characters and these stories and, you know, their personalities and all this stuff. Um, and then it's up to us to handle that at some point, you know. And, and so that trust, and not only that, but um, like what we talked about, every, every step builds on what came before that. And um, I know for me and the other board artists, we've just drawn black and white all day. And so when we see a background or something come back, I'm like, oh my gosh, I had no idea it was going to be all pink. Or I didn't know it was going to be, you know. And um, I mean, I've had some of the background painters come over to my office and ask, what were you thinking? What were you picturing when you drew this or when you did, you know? And that's collaboration that doesn't necessarily have to happen. Everybody could come to work, they could go to their desk, they could do their job, they could go home. Um, but we hang out, we see each other all the time. You know, it's, that's, that's, I think, not to steal Amanda's answer, but that I agree, it's, it's the best part. We're totally stealing Amanda's answer. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the yeah, writers, and this is the best writers room I've ever been in. And you really have to be in a comfortable environment if you're gonna pitch jokes all day and risk falling on your face and making a complete fool out of yourself. <laughs> and now I do it without even thinking. Like, it just happened because I'm with a group of people who are doing the same thing and aren't going to make fun of you for doing it. They're going to love it. Um, and that makes it such a joy. And I agree with Jordan. In as much as the, the artists and the, and the color stylists come to you, the board artists come to the writers with questions or ask about opinions. It really is collaborative from beginning to end. It's such a great place to be. And that is all because of yeah. this. It's absolutely the standard that Chris has set. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say for, for me, the difference. I've only worked on two shows, but the other was Legend of Korra, which is also a very good show. I'm proud of it. And like the, Mike and Brian ran it extremely well. But Chris knows his stuff, and he's so... It's the right amount of involvement in kind of all of the stages that he allows people to do their thing while also making sure to guide it and keep the continuity. Um, and that allows for everyone, that includes even production, like understanding what the timelines are and things like that. So for those of you that have aspirations of, you know, creating and running a show and things like that, you know, look to people like Chris as to like how to run something and how to run it right. Um, and part of that is putting in a lot of time and a lot of effort and learning a lot about all of the different stages, all the things that we went through, like Chris has done a little bit in all of those, you know. Um, but it's, you know, like it's such a good group of people that has been built together and we have this amazing, you know, leader and showrunner who we can, you know, kind of rally behind. Um, so that's a big difference for me. 
Well, we're out of time. Yeah, we're out of time. Thank you guys so much. All for right. Right. That's a virtual claps. <laughs> yep. That's to the uh, fan page. Thanks for, for watching, fan page at the Loud House. Hope you guys enjoy the panel. Yeah.